Part 2 of Magnetic Fields of Transatoms Spin Nuclide Electronic Condensate by G.V. Mashinsky. Uh, in this one I'm going to start looking at uh, electronic condensation inside the core. He goes over um, uh, some sort of preamble and so forth. And uh, uh, what I really want to focus on is he's picking out work by uh, Adamenko. Uh, who I've talked a lot about, and he's saying uh, one of the experiments recorded a uni unique track cluster consisting of 276 tracks of alpha particles with energies in the 46 mega electron volt range. The particles belonged to the same family and flew out of one common center. Perhaps the appearance of these clusters is precisely connected with the creation and decay of a supercharged nucleus. The mass of the alpha particles is 276 times 4, equals 1104 AMU. The total charge is 552. The energy released in the decay is 1100 to 1660 mega electron volts. Uh, indeed, as will be clear from the discussion below, when a multinucleus better than heavy ones with a charge of Z equals 80 uh, merge into a single compound. So let's just have a look at what Z equals 80 is. Um, uh, so uh, we've got 80 here is uh, mercury uh, and it's interesting because uh, uh, mercury was used by shoulders on his uh, experiments uh, producing his charge clusters uh, his evos uh, merges into a single compound a supercharged nucleus with an uh, initial charge of z as approximately a thousand Z is much greater than 170. Uh, uh, his preamble up here is that uh, when when uh, the uh, nucleus Z is over 170, uh, there's uh, some restructuring of the vacuum and the um, uh, the large number of electrons uh, are located in the nucleus, and so the charge of these electrons is almost completely compensated for the charge of the nucleus. Um, so this is a parameter. Uh, where if something is great, much over great, uh, 170 uh, in this case uh, of uh, the work from Adamenko. So because of this, a huge energy is released that breaks the nucleus of the compound into alpha particles with a total charge of 552. The law of conservation of momentum makes it possible to create a jet of alpha particles. This is very interesting because... Uh, when you are looking at, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Leclerc, he observed that uh, he was producing a lot of uh, elements uh, that um, uh, were uh, the addition of an alpha particle. So could it have been that um, these things were being created and, and, and uh, destabilized and threw out these very high energy alpha particles that were uh, then interacting with other material, um, uh, that's one poten potential uh, observation. Um, so this is where it gets really interesting for me. Uh, Bose condensate of atomic electrons transatoms. If we cannot place electrons inside the nucleus, we must try to arrange them as close as possible to the nucleus. One of the hypothetical opportunities to do uh, is uh, do this is to turn an atomic fermionic electron gas into a bosonic one. Now, electrons normally, because uh, they're fermions, they can't occupy the same space and time. They, their charges will repel each other, and they'll, if if they're in some sort of confined area, they'll 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 arrange themselves uh, um, uh, respective to that charge. Uh, if you can make them into a, some sort of a boson, then they can occupy the same space time. So he says, therefore, it is necessary that under the influence of a strong electromagnetic field inside the capsule. Uh, so the capsule, I'm saying, maybe, um, you know, this uh, 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 exotic vacuum object, the, the um, condensed plasmoid, uh, let's say. And that's my assumption. I hope to get more detail from him tomorrow. Uh, that under the influence of a strong electromagnetic field inside the capsule, atomic electrons pairwise form Cooper pairs, thereby transforming into bosons. If the hypothesis of pairing electrons in the transatom is realized, then since bosons can occupy the same quantum state, all the created Cooper pairs of atomic electrons will occupy the lowest energy state. 
the lowest orbital closest to the trans nucleus. Thus, the trans atoms will have a size much smaller than ordinary atoms. So this is condensing matter. This is looks like it's packing things into a box to a certain degree. Obviously, he's saying that the uh, Cooper pairs uh, arise between conduction electrons in metals at helium temperatures. Uh, but obviously, we need this to happen at higher temperatures. Uh, and here we get, get the uh, idea about superconductivity. A free conduction electron that moves inside a crystal lattice and interacts uh, electromagnetically with it generates vibrational motions in the lattice. The oscillations of the lattice charge in turn act on the electron. These vibrations of the crystal lattice are quantized by introducing phonons. Okay, what is a phonon? Well, uh, I'm looking at Wikipedia here, the phonon is uh, uh, essentially, it's saying, the concept of phonons was introduced in 1932 by Soviet physicist Igor Tam. The name phonon comes from the Greek word uh, phone, which translates to sound or voice, because long wavelength phonons give rise to sound. The name is based on the word photon. So uh, <clears throat> when you look at this, it's basically a vibration in, in the lattice, uh, and there are very many ways you can cause vibration in the lattice. And essentially all of the ways you can really create vibration in the lattice were identified and put as ways to stimulate the reaction uh, by Piantelli. So, he's saying, Therefore, the interaction of a lattice with an electron can be regarded as the result of a continuous emission and absorption of phonons by an electron. This is where the really meat of this argument comes. The charge fluctuations of the crystal lattice caused by the electron-phonon interaction can lead to an effective electron environment with a positive screening charge exceeding the negative charge of the electron. As a consequence, another electron is attracted by this net positive charge. Thus, the interaction of electrons with phonons in some cases can lead to some effective attraction between their electrons. If the attraction of two electrons exceeds their Coulomb repulsion, they form a bound state, the Cooper pair. So, we're not forming Cooper pairs because it's getting so cold. We're forming Cooper pairs because we're introducing phonons. I'll give you some examples. Uh, maybe if we put a huge electrical shock in it, uh, you might get phonons. Or, or you heat it up to a high temperature, you get phonons. Or you might throw some sound at it and you get some phonons. Uh, or you, you have it hot and then you f cool it very suddenly. You get some uh, shock wave and, and some phonons. Uh, and maybe some EM interaction, you get some uh, phonons. So this is very, very interesting. Now, what, what can these phonons do? Uh, well, it, it goes into the meat of the argument here. It's a, a, you do need to read it. It's, it's really valuable to read this. And um, there are a lot of uh, scientific kind of like notations that uh, were difficult to translate. And for those, I would ask you to refer back to the original paper uh, where you can uh, uh, get a view of it. So th there's lots of notifications like this, which I've, I've tried to do as best as I could. Um, but there was no uh, scientific... Uh, um, uh, formula generator in, in the application that I was doing the translation with. Uh, and so uh, I would refer back uh, for really specific understanding of what's being said. Um, but you can get the bulk of what the argument from uh, reading the English here. So um, it goes into a lot of explanation, a lot of explanation. And then here, here we go. So uh, in normal parahelium para is here, orthohelium is, is here. Uh, where the spins are, you know, up, down, and uh, up, up, but in different orbits. But in transhelium, the uh, spins are in the same orbit because they're socialized into the ground state orbit and in the same direction. Schematically, in uh, figure two, schematically depicts the basic states of electrons in parahelium, orthohelium, and transhelium. The energy levels of parahelium up down with uh, an anti-parallel orientation of the electron spins differ substantially from orthohelium levels with a parallel orientation of the spin. This is due to the fact that the average energy of the Coulomb interaction repulsion of the two electrons in the orthohelium turns out to be less than that of the parahelium. 
In figure two, the arrows indicate the directions of the electron spins. Uh, so um, this goes into more and more detail. And uh, again, more detail. Uh, it's a little bit complicated for the, the video that I'm trying to put out here. But uh, here is the, the key takeaway. The electron spins in the Cooper pair of the trans atom are parallel. The Cooper pair in the trans atom forms a boson with S equals 1. Electrons in a trans atom are coupled in pairs to form bosons. Bosons in the trans atom occupy the same quantum state, boson condon state, bose condon state, while the lowest in energy. And so it gives a, a range of uh, light trans atoms here, like trans beryllium, uh, trans carbon. So you've got your six electrons uh, from your carbon atom uh, with all the spins uh, aligned, uh, trans oxygen with the eight, uh, trans boron. And so what, what you're seeing here is, and he'll, he'll explain it down here, the spin of an odd electron, for instance, for boron or nitrogen, uh, in uh, in the ground state is directed in the opposite direction with respect to the direction of the spins of the paired electrons in the trans atom. So the odd one uh, goes down. So five trans atom radius. <clears throat> Since the spins of all the electrons in the trans atom are parallel, their magnetic moments mu e uh, are. Uh, also parallel. The latter create in the entire region of the trans atom a giant magnetic field with a vector of magnetic induction Vu. Uh, the trans atom is magnetic. So here we start to see um, some potential explanation for uh, the magnons of Centilli. Uh, we also see uh, the fact that when we were doing our Chalani wires and when they were uh, treated there was a change in uh, magnetic behavior of them. Uh, in Hutchison, he had some bizarre magnetic properties uh, uh, from some of his tre treated materials when the uh, starting material like copper or aluminium uh, or other like stainless steel wasn't magnetic and, and suddenly it became bizarrely magnetic. Uh, so uh, th this is very, very interesting what he, he's saying here. Um, so he goes into a lot of explanation. I've had to like put images in, uh, but it's, it's better laid out in the original, but uh, it's a little bit confusing because of all the Russian <laughs> for those uh, in the uh, English world. Um, but the kind of uh, uh, magnetic fields are, are very, very large, and they depend on the element um, that is uh, uh, in this state. So I'm going to go quickly just run through this because uh not run through it but just skip over and you can read this and it's really valuable to read this uh, in your own time magnetic fields of trans atoms okay so he goes into more detail here and the vectors and the the uh, uh, parameters that change uh, those uh, uh, magnetic strengths um, and get down to where. So, uh, this I think is very important. When converting atoms to trans atoms, it is not necessary that all atomic electrons be connected to Cooper pairs. So, uh, he calls these things a trans atom chimera. So, um, you know, if you have all of your um, uh, electrons in Cooper pairs, you don't necessarily get as strong a uh, magnetic field because it, it, there's a relationship between the amount of electrons uh, in the uh, uh, closest orbital to the uh, nucleus. Um, and uh, if you add more electrons, they then they kind of like move further out in the socialized sense. And so the overall magnetic field uh, close to the nucleus is, is less uh, powerful. Uh, and so it's not, you kind of like, almost don't want to push it too hard otherwise you you actually don't you would you would suggest suggest that with certain materials you wouldn't necessarily get the effect um, for example when the number of paired electrons is p equals 10 the radius of the orbital of thorium z equals 90 uh, uh, so the radius of z is um, uh, uh, radius uh, this is lowercase z not not um, um, z number uh, 7 uh, 7.3 times 10 to the minus 13 uh, and uh, uh, this. So the, the relationship uh, when it uh, has uh, 
Uh, so I've not read that very well. <laughs> and, and since the magnetic induction in the center, the, 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 its value for thorium is 10 to the uh, 0.3 times 10 to the power 8 Tesla. This is three orders of magnitude greater than 2.7 times 10 to the 5 uh, Tesla than if all the electrons in the thorium were paired. Okay, so so basically, in in uh, if we go to figure 10, uh, where's figure 10? Okay, it's not so easy to understand that, but um, essentially what he's saying, for the case of thorium, maybe we can pick it up here. For so so thorium is uh, 90. So we got 90 here. So if all of the uh, electrons were paired, i.e. The, the number of paired electrons is, is equal to the charge, the, the Z, the uh, number of protons, the charge or the, the nucleus. So 90, you have uh, this kind of level of uh, magnetic uh, field. But if it's uh, 90 and you've got only 10, you've got this kind of level of magnetic field. So this is where your three orders of magnitude increased magnetic field um, uh, is derived from when you've got a heavy... Uh, nucleus uh, with uh, only 10 paired electrons as opposed to all of its electrons paired. So that's really what I'm trying to focus on here. In figure 12, so this is figure 12, uh, shows the dependence of the magnetic induction at the center of the transatom with a constant number of paired electrons, PE, from the charge of the nucleus Z. In the case when not all, but only a fraction of the atomic electrons are connected to the Cooper pairs, in formulas 13 to 16, the charge of the nucleus Z must be replaced by PE. That's just a, uh, how you work it out. So I'm going to stop there and uh, I will record uh, three in a little while.